The Rocket Man by Ray Bradbury. The electrical fires were hovering above Mother's dark hair to light her path. She stood in her bedroom door, looking out at me as I passed in the silent hall. You will help me keep him there this time, won't you? She asked. I guess so, I said. Please. The fireflies cast moving bits of light on her white face. This time, he mustn't go away. All right, I said after standing there a moment, but it won't do any good. It's no use. She went away and the fireflies on their electric circuits fluttered after her like an errant constellation, showing her how to walk in darkness. I heard her say faintly, we've got to try anyway. Other fireflies followed me to my room. When the weight of my body cut a circuit in the bed, the fireflies winked out. It was midnight, and my mother and I waited our rooms separated by darkness in bed. The bed began to rock me and sing to me. I touched a switch. The singing and rocking stopped. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to sleep at all. This night was no different from a thousand others in our time. We would wake nights and feel the cool air turn hot, feel the fire and the wind, or see the walls burned a bright color for an instant. Then we knew his rocket was over our house, his rocket, and the oak tree swaying from the concussion. And I would lie there, eyes wide, panting, and mother in a room. Her voice would come to me over the interroom radio. Did you feel it? And I would answer, that was him, all right. That was my father's ship passing over our town, a small town where space rockets never came. We would lie awake for the next two hours thinking, now dad's landed in Springfield. Now he's on the tarmac. Now he's signing the papers. Now he's in the helicopter. Now he's over the river. And now the hills. Now he's settling the helicopter at the little airport, Green Village here. And it won't, and the night would be half over when, in our separate cool beds, Mother and I would be listening, listening. Now he's walking down Bell Street. He always walks, never takes a cab. Now across the park, now turning the corner of Oakhurst. And now I lifted my head from my pillow. Far down the street, coming closer and closer, smartly, quickly, briskly footsteps. Now turning in at our house and up the porch steps. And we both smiling in the cool darkness, mom and I, when he heard the front door open in recognition, speak a quiet word of welcome and shut downstairs. Three hours later, I turned the brass knob to their room, quietly holding my breath, balancing in a darkness as big as the space between the planets. My hand out to reach the small black case at the foot of my parents' sleeping bed. Taking it, I ran silently to my room, thinking, he won't tell me. He doesn't want me to know. And from the open case spilled his black uniform like a black nebula, stars glittering here or there distantly in the material. I needed the dark stuff in my warm hands. I smelled the planet Mars, an iron smell, the planet Venus, a green ivy smell, the planet Mercury, a scent of sulfur and fire. I could smell the milky moon and the hardness of stars. I pushed the uniform into a centrifuge machine, and I put it in my ninth grade shop last year that year, scented whirling. Soon a fine powder precipitated into a retort. This I slid under a microscope. And while my parents slept unaware, and while our house was asleep, all the automatic bakers and servers and robot cleaners and the electric slumber, I stared down upon brilliant motes of meteor dust, comet tail and loam from far Jupiter glistening like worlds themselves which drew me down the tube a billion miles into space at terrific accelerations. At dawn, exhausted with my journey and fearful of discovery, I returned the box uniform to their sleeping room. And then I slept only to waken at the sound of the horn of the dry cleaning car, which stopped in the yard below. They took the black uniform box with them. It's good I didn't wait, I thought. 
for the uniform would be back in an hour, clean of all its destiny and travel. I slept again with the little vial of magic dust in my pajama pocket over my beating heart. When I came downstairs, there was Dad at the table, biting into his toast. Sleep good, dog, he said, as if he had been there all the time. Hadn't been gone for three months. All right, I said. Toast? He pressed a button, and the breakfast table made me four pieces, golden brown. I remember my father that afternoon, digging and digging in the garden, like an animal after something, it seemed. There he was with his long, dark arms, moving swiftly, planting, tamping, fixing, cutting, pruning, his dark face always down to the soil, his eyes always down to what he was doing, never up to the sky, never looking at me or mother even, unless we knelt with him to feel the earth soak up through the overalls at our knees. We put our hands into the black dirt and not look at the bright, crazy sky. Then he would glance to either side, to mother or me, and give us a gentle wink and go on, bent down, face down, the sky staring at his back. That night we sat on the mechanical porch swing, which swung us and blew a wind upon us and sang to us. It was summer and moonlight and we had lemonade to drink. And we held the cool glasses in our hands and dad read the stereo newspapers inserted into the special hat you put on your head and which turned the microscopic page in front of us, a front of the magazine lens if you blinked three times in succession. Dad smoked cigarettes and told me about how it was and when he was a boy in the year 1997. After a while, he said, as he always said, why aren't you out playing kick the can, dog? I didn't say anything, but Mom said, He does, on nights when you're not here. Dad looked at me, and then, for the first time that day, at the sky. Mother always watched him when he glanced at the stars. The first day and night when he got home, he wouldn't look at the sky much. I thought about him gardening and gardening so furiously, his face almost driven into the earth. But the second night... He looked at the stars a little more. Mother wasn't afraid of the sky in the day so much, but it was the night stars that she wanted to turn off. And sometimes I could almost see her reaching for a switch in her mind, but never finding it. And by the third night, maybe dad be out on the front porch until way after we all were ready for bed. And then I'd hear mom call him in, almost like she called me from the street sometimes. And then I would hear Dad fitting the electric eye door lock in its place with a sigh. The next morning at breakfast, I'd glance down and see his little black case near his feet as he buttered his toast and Mother slept late. We'll be seeing you, dog, he'd say, and we'd shake hands. In about three months. Right. And he'd walk away down the street, not taking a helicopter or beetle or bus, just walking with his uniform hidden in a small underarm case. He didn't want anyone to think he was vain about being a rocket man. Mother would come out to eat breakfast, one piece of dry toast about an hour later. But now it was tonight, the first night, the good night, and he wasn't looking at the stars much at all. Let's go to the television carnival, I said. Fine, said Dad. Mother smiled at me. And we rushed off to the town in a helicopter and took dad through a thousand exhibits to keep his face and head down with us and not looking anywhere else. And as we laughed at the funny things and looked serious at the serious ones, I thought, my father goes to Saturn and Neptune and Pluto, but he never brings me presents. Other boys whose fathers go into space bring back bits of ore from Cal Calisto, and hunks of black meteor or blue sand. But I have to get my own collection, trading from other boys, the Martian rocks and the Mercurian sands, which fill my room, but about which Dad would never comment. On occasion, I remembered, he brought something for Mother. He planted some Martian sunflowers once in our yard, but after he was gone a month and the sunflowers grew, grew large, Mom ran out one day and cut them all down. Without thinking, as we paused at one of the three-dimensional exhibits, I asked Dad the question I always asked. What's it like out in space? 
Mother shot me a frightened glance. It was too late. Dad stood there for a full minute trying to find an answer, and then he shrugged. It's the best thing in a lifetime of best things. And then he caught himself. Oh, it's really nothing at all. Routine. You wouldn't like it. He looked at me apprehensively. But you always go back. Habit. Where are you going next? I haven't decided yet. I'll think it over. He always thought it over. In those days, rocket pilots were rare, and he could pick and choose and work when he liked. And on the third night of his homecoming, you could see him picking and choosing among the stars. Come on, said Mother. Let's go home. It was still early when we got home. I wanted Dad to put on his uniform. I shouldn't have asked. It always made Mother unhappy. But I couldn't help myself. I kept at him, though he had always refused. I had never seen him in it. And at last he said, Oh, all right. We waited in the parlor when he went upstairs and the air flew. Mother looked at me dully, as if she couldn't believe that her own son could do this to her. I glanced away. I'm sorry, I said. You're not helping at all, she said. At all. There was a whisper on the air flue in a moment. Here I am, Dad said quietly. We looked at him in his uniform. It was glossy black with silver buttons and silver rims to the heels of the black boots, and it looked as if someone had cut the arms and legs and body from a dark nebula with little faint stars glowing through it. It fit as close as a glove fits to a slender long hand, and it smelled like cool air and metal, and space, and it smelled of fire and time. And Father stood smiling awkwardly in the center of the room. Turn around, said Mother. Her eyes were remote, looking at him. But when he was gone, she never talked of him. She never said anything about anything, but the weather, or the condition on my neck, and the needs of a washcloth for it, or the fact that she didn't sleep nights. Once she said the light was too strong at night. But there's no moon this week, I said. There's starlight, she said. I went to the store and bought her some darker, greener shades. As I lay in the bed at night, I could hear her pulling them down tight to the bottom of the windows. It made a long, rustling noise. Once I tried to mow the lawn. No. Mom stood in the doorway. Put the mower away. So the grass went three months at a time without cutting. Dad cut it when he came home. She wouldn't let me do anything else either, like repairing the electrical breakfast maker or the mechanical book reader. She saved everything up, as if for Christmas. And then I would see Dad hammering or tinkering, and I was and always smiling at his work, and Mother smiling over him happy. No, she never talked of him while he was gone. And as for Dad, he never did anything to make a contact across the millions of miles. He said once, if I called you, I'd want you to be I'd want to be with you. I wouldn't be happy. Once Dad said to me, Your mother treats me sometimes, as if I weren't here, as if I were invisible. I had seen her do it. She just looked beyond him over his shoulder at his chin or hands, but never into his eyes. If she did look at his eyes, her eyes were covered with a film, like an animal going to sleep. She said yes at the right times and smiled, but always a half a second later than expected. I'm not there for her, said Dad. But other days, she would be there, and he would be there for her, and they would hold hands and walk around the block or take rides with Mom's hair flying like a girl's behind her, and she would cut off all the mechanical devices in the kitchen and bake him incredible cakes and pies and cookies, looking deep into his face with her smile, a real smile. But at the end of such days, when he was there for her, she would always cry, and Dad would stand helpless, gazing about the room as if to find the answer but never finding it. Dad turned slowly in his uniform for us to see. Turn around again, said Mom. The next morning, Dad came rushing into the house with a handful of tickets 
pink rocket tickets for California, blue tickets for Mexico. Come on, he said. We'll buy disposable clothes and burn them when they're soiled. Look, we can take the not the noon rocket to L.A., the two o'clock helicopter to Santa Barbara, the nine o'clock plane to Ensenada, sleep overnight. And we went to California and up and down the Pacific coast for a day and a half, settling at last on the sands of Malibu to cook wieners at night. Dad was always listening or singing or watching things on all sides of him, holding on to things as if the world were a centrifuge, going so swiftly that he might be flung off away from us at any instant. The last afternoon at Malibu, Mom was up in the hotel room. Dad lay on the sand beside me for a long time in the hot sun. Ah, he sighed. This is it. His eyes were gently closed and he lay on his back, drinking the sun. You missed this, he said. He meant on the rocket, of course, but he never said the rocket or mentioned the rocket and all the things you couldn't have on the rocket. You couldn't have a salt wind on the rocket or a blue sky or a yellow moon or mom's cooking. You couldn't talk to your 14-year-old boy on a rocket. Let's hear it, he said at last. And I knew that now we would talk, as we had always talked, for three hours straight. All afternoon, we'd murmur back and forth in the lazy sun about my school, school grades, how high I could jump and how fast I could swim. Dad nodded each time I spoke and smiled and slapped my chest lightly in approval. We talked. We didn't talk of rockets or space, but we talked of Mexico, where we had driven once in an ancient car, and of the butterflies we had caught in the rainforest on the green, warm Mexico of noon. Seeing a hundred butterflies sucked into our radiator, dying there, beating their blue and crimson wings, twitching, beautiful and sad. We talked of things instead of the things I wanted to talk about. And he listened to me. That was the thing he did, as if he was trying to fill himself up with all the sounds he could hear. He listened to the wind and the falling ocean of my voice, always with a rapt attention a concentration that almost excluded physical bodies themselves and kept only the song sounds. He shut his eyes to listen. I would see him listening in the lawnmower as he cut the grass by hand instead of using the remote control device. And I would see him smelling the cut grass as it sprayed up at him beyond the, behind the mower in green fount. Doug, he said about five in the afternoon as we were picking up our towels and heading back along the beach near the surf. I want you to promise me something. What? Don't ever be a rocket man. I stopped. I mean it, he said, because when you're out there, you want to be here. And when you're here, you want to be out there. Don't start that. Don't let it get a hold of you. But you don't know what it is. Every time I'm out there, I think, if I ever get back to Earth, I'll stay there. I'll never go out again, but I go out. I guess I'll always go out. I've thought about being a rocket man for a long time, I said. He didn't hear me. I tried to stay here. Last Saturday when I got home, I started trying so damned hard to stay here. I remember him in the garden sweating and all the traveling and doing and listening. I knew that he did this to convince himself that the sea and the towns and the land and his family were the only real things and the only good things. I knew where he would be tonight, out at the jewelry in Orion from our front porch. Promise me you won't be like me, he said. I hesitated a while. Okay, I said. He shook my hand. Good boy, he said. The dinner was fine that night. Mom had run about the kitchen with handfuls of cinnamon and dough and pots and pans tinkling, and now a great turkey fumed on the table with dressing and cranberry sauce, peas and pumpkin pie. In the middle of August, Dad said amazed, you won't be here for Thanksgiving. So I won't. He sniffed it. 
He lifted each lid from each tureen and left the flavor steam over his sunburned face. He said, ah, to each. He looked at the room, at his hands, and he gazed at the pictures on the wall, the chairs, the table, me and mom. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I saw him make up his mind. Lily? Yes? Mom looked across her table, which had set like a wonderful silver trap, a miraculous gravy pit into which, like a struggling beast of the past caught in a tar pool, her husband might be the last be caught and held, gazing out through a jail of wishbones, safe forever. Her eyes sparkled. Lily, said Dad. Go on, I thought crazily. Say it, quick. Say you'll stay home this time for good and never go away. Say it. Just then, a passing helicopter jarred the room, and the window pane shook with a crystal sound. Dad glanced at the window. The blue stars of evening were there, and the red planet Mars was rising in the east. Dad looked at Mars a full minute. He put out his hand blindly towards me. May I have some peas, he said. Excuse me, said Mother. I'm going to get some bread. And she rushed out into the kitchen. But there's bread on the table, I said. Dad didn't look at me as he began his meal. I couldn't sleep that night. I came downstairs at one in the morning, and the moonlight was like ice cream all on all the housetops, and dew glittered in a snowfield on our grass. I stood in the doorway in my pajamas, feeling the warm night wind, and then I knew that Dad was sitting on the mechanical porch swing, gliding gently. I could see his profile tilted back, and he was watching the stars wheel over the skies. His eyes were like gray crystal there, the moon in each one. And I went out and sat beside him, and we glided a while on the swing. At last I said, How many ways are there to die in space? A million. Name some. The meteors hit you, the air goes out of your rocket, or comets take you along with them. Concussion, strangulation, explosion, centrifugal force, too much acceleration, too little. The heat, the cold, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the asteroids, the planetoids, radiation. And do they bury you? They never find you. Where do you go? A billion miles away, traveling graves, they call them. You become a meteor or a planetoid traveling forever through space. They said nothing. One thing, he said later, it's a quick, it's quick in space, death. It's over like that. You don't linger. Most of the time you don't even know it. You're dead and that's it. We went to bed. It was morning. Standing in the doorway, dad listened to the yellow canary singing its golden cage. Well, I've decided, he said, next time I come home, I'm home to stay. Dad, I said. Tell your mother. Tell your mother that when she gets up, he said. You mean it? He nodded gravely. See you in about three months. And there he went off down the street, carrying his uniform in a secret box, whistling and looking at the tall green trees and picking china berries off the china berry bush as he brushed by, tossing them ahead of him as he walked away into the bright shade of early morning. I asked mother about a few things that morning after father had gone a number of hours. Dad said that sometimes you don't act as if you hear him or see him, I said. And then she explained everything to me quietly. When he went off into space 10 years ago, I said to myself, he's dead or as good as dead. So think of him as dead. And when he comes back three or four times a year, it's not him at all. It's only a pleasant little memory or a dream. And if a memory stops or a dream stops, it can't hurt half as much. So most of the time I think of him as dead. But other times, other times I can't help myself. I bake pies and treat him as if he were alive and then it hurts. No, it's better to think he hasn't been here for 10 years and I'll never see him again. It doesn't hurt as much. Didn't he say next time he'd settle down? She shook her head slowly. No, he's dead. I'm very sure of that. He'll come alive again then, I said. Ten years ago, said Mother. 
I thought, what if he dies on Venus? Then we'll never be able to see Venus again. What if he dies on Mars? We'll never be able to look at Mars again, all red in the sky without wanting to go in and lock the door. Or what if he died on Jupiter or Saturn or Neptune? On those nights when those planets were high in the sky, we wouldn't want to have anything to do with the stars. I guess not, I said. The message came the next day. A messenger gave it to me, and I read it standing on the porch. The sun was setting. Mom stood in the screen door behind me, watching me fold the message and put it in my pocket. Mom, I said, don't tell me anything. I don't already know, she said. She didn't cry. Well, it wasn't Mars, it wasn't Venus, and it wasn't Jupiter or Saturn that killed him. We would have we wouldn't have to think of him every time Jupiter or Saturn or Mars lit up in the evening. This was different. His ship had fallen into the sun, and the sun was big and fiery and merciless, and it was always in the sky, and you couldn't get away from it. So, for a long time after my father died, my mother slept through the days and wouldn't go out. We had breakfast at midnight and lunch at three in the morning and dinner at the cold, dim hour of 6 a.m. We went to all-night shows and went to bed at sunrise. And for a long while, the only days we ever went out to walk were the days when it was raining and there was no sun. <laughs>